Thanks for uh, waiting. It's a little bit more uh, complex setup than than it is sometimes, <laughs> uh, for reasons which will become apparent. Um, really happy this week to uh, have Guy Sherwin, uh, someone I've known for many years, who's been working with 16mm uh, film uh, for, for many uh, years now. So today's session is uh, analog with a capital A, I'd say. <laughs> and uh, so please welcome Guy Sherwin, who's going to show some work and talk about his work. And a lot of you uh, are so young that this technology will be completely mysterious to you. So um, there will be opportunities to ask if, if Guy hasn't already explained what's going on and, and how things are being done. So, Welcome, Guy. OK. Do you think the script to use that instead of that? Or is uh, it? No, that's going into the thing, okay, so okay. All right. So um, thank you very much, John, for in inviting me. And two technicians, John and one beginning with S? Yeah, OK, thanks <laughs> for having me set up. It has been very difficult. We just had half an hour to set up. Um, John suggested I do a little bio introduction um, to get you in the mood. I am um, giving a sort of like trajectory from, well, art school. I, I went to Chelsea Art School and studied painting and um, discovered film along the way, even though it wasn't taught at that art school. but. Um, I kind of picked it up independently, really. I never went to, I never went to film school or studied it formally. Um, but I was just fascinated by the, by the fact of film, the fact you could actually translate static images into motion. Um, I've got a bit of a scientific kind of family. I, my dad was a scientist and my brother was a, is a scientist. And uh, there's a kind of, one way of understanding the films I'm going to show you is, is a kind of inquiry into the mechanics, the optics, the brain, how we perceive information, make sense of it, um, that kind of curiosity. I think it's driven largely by curiosity. And somewhere along, along the line, that kind of makes films. So there's a bit of a strange jump across from curiosity into aesthetics, you know, uh, which I've managed to bridge, I think. Although, interestingly, some of the first things I did, I never showed when I first made them. They weren't, I didn't imagine that would, anyone would want to see them, because they were just like experiments for myself. But much later, people have shown an interest, so I have, I have shown them later. Uh, John mentioned the technology. There's two projectors at the back there, low down. Some of you on that side won't be able to see what's going on. Um, but. Those are two 16 millimeter projectors. Just a quick show of hands, actually. Anyone familiar with, I say, 16 millimeter film? Have you seen one before? Have you know what's going on, roughly? OK. All right, just a few of you. Um, so what I've, knowing that you're sound students, I've aimed this, this entire program to be about sound. And that means in film, it doesn't have to mean, but in my case, it's optical sound. Optical sound is the the little track that runs alongside the film itself. And we can sh we can, I can pass these bits around, but that is 16 millimeter film because that is the width of the film itself. Film you put into your still camera used to be 35 mil, which is the size of a, another gauge, more like cinema gauge, gauge film. And the picture is 24 frames per second. That's about that long, so about one second of film. The sound, that's one second of sound. And the sound is carried by light. It's really, um, I imagine it like a sort of gramophone needle that's inscribing a pattern of light, very, very fine light, into the side of the image. So that when the projector is playing the picture, it has a little translation head in the picture, a little light bulb, which is then translating that pattern of light back into sound. So the you know acoustic sound is converted first into a pattern of light and then back into sound. Um, there are many programs on computers that can do that. So you can very easily press a button and convert an image into a sound. So you could, you could hear what that's, that curtain sounded like or what my face sounded like if you wanted to. Um, I did quite a number of films in this way. And I produced a DVD which in 2007, which I think John thinks may well be in the library. And it has about um, 16 examples of different approaches to making optical sound. 
And so you're going to see some of these live. I mean, that, obviously that's digital, but it, the originals were all film. Um, so let's get on with the program. The first half of called abstraction, the first part is abstraction in film. So these are all techniques which use the raw material of film, the stuff I just showed you. This is a piece of leader. This is anyway film with images that's gone through a camera. Um, and I found various ways of attacking it by chemicals, by punching holes, by, by darkroom processes as well. So I'll, I'll touch on these as we go past. So we'll have little pauses between each film. Um, and there may be a few teething problems to do with the sound EQ, because we've had a bit of a rush to set this up. OK, so the first one is going to be called, uh, or is called, Sound Shapes. They're all quite short films. And they all deal with quite specific ideas. Um, we need some less light. When I say short, this, I think this is about two minutes. Can we have even less light than that? I mean, no light. And that one? And the door? OK, well, it's, you know, I mean, it, these were first shown in um, the London Filmmakers Co-op, which had a purpose-built sort of black cinema space. And so they do need really quite a, a, a good black, ideally.
film is all spooled up on a reel, um, separated by some leaders, so there are little gaps between each one. Um, yeah, I, maybe I'm going to be doing too much talking, but maybe you, if you don't like the talking, you can tell me to stop. Um, I'll explain how this is done. It's, it's very simple. It's black film, black leader, um, and it's using hole punches that, you know, ticket inspectors use. Circular ones, triangular ones, rectangular ones. So I just collected some of those. And um, as I say, I was very curious to see what would happen. Well, I was really trying to understand music, I suppose, visually, you know, like, you know the rhythms in music. So film has 24 frames per second, and it divides nicely into, you know, like eight threes, six fours, 12 twos. So I could subdivide that into different sort of intervals, you know. Um, so I could allocate one shape to a particular sound, actually. And the sound is created by scratching into the soundtrack area. So for example, a triangle might have six little scratches, and a rectangle might have only three. And that would make a different pitch of sound. So I had a little bit of control over the quality of sound to identify one sound with one shape. And then um, it was really a question of throwing different rhythms together uh, to see what would happen if you know if the visual rhythm was was actually echoing exactly the the um, sound rhythm or vice versa. By the way, I should have warned you that a lot, some of these films are very optical, so um, but they're not too too long, so you can always just look at them through your fingers or I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay, so question what at the front. Film, what year was that made? Then? Well, that was actually made in 1972. I know. Don't. <laughs> um, how long? How long ago is that now? Is it like 46 years ago? Now, actually, that's one of the films. Not the color version. The black and white version was made and, and not shown then. I just did it for myself, and I never actually showed it until this century. So it had to wait a fair time before it got seen publicly. Um, and then by that time, I was able to make prints. Well, I could have done that before, but having made a print, a print is a, you know, it, it goes to a negative stage and then comes back into a positive through two, two print stages. That's a darkroom print, OK? You shine light through, make a copy. Um, having done that, I thought, OK, maybe I'll try painting it. Because you can't, obviously, you can't paint a hole. By punching holes in, you can't paint the holes. So. Um, I could put sellotape across and painted those, but I didn't think of doing that. So then, this is a, the, 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 sat, the, the color part of this film was added around 2007, I think. OK, that'll bring us on to the next film. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me all right, put the back? We're going to switch mics, actually. Are we? We're going to go with the other one. OK, I much prefer this one. I feel I have more control. Should I take this off? Okay. One. Bring it right down. Okay. All right. Technical difficulties over. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Right. Where was that? We're going to see the next short film too. Now, this is actually quite recent. Um, I think it's just from a couple of years ago. Again, a technical explanation here. Um, I have a bunch of film because I, I don't really throw things away. So, lots of these film materials that normal people would throw in the bin, I just kept. So I have loads and loads of um, what's called stock, raw stock, you know, like outdated film, which may or may not create an image if you pass it through a camera. 
or bits of leader like this, which is used for threading the film up so you don't ruin your own film. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a type of color stock. In fact, I think most color stocks um, have what's called a remjet backing. Remjet is the name of this film. Um, and with film, you have, it's made of acetate. It's an acetate strip with sprocket holes down the side. On one side is the light sensitive emulsion, which, when it's exposed to light coming through the lens, creates an image, usually in negative. I mean, when it's processed, it usually goes to negative. On the back of the color film is a backing called Remjet, which is just a, a black carbon backing, which stops the light spilling around and creating sort of halos and things. So it's, um, it's called a Remjet backing. Anyway, I, I discovered that I can actually create marks on both sides of the film so it's a bit like the punching, but I'm actually scratching into it this time. And I'm scratching on both sides of this film. So uh, only where the lines cross do you see something. Because then you've got a, you know, you're removing the emulsion on one side, and you're removing the remjet backing on the other side. And at that point, you're seeing a, a cross. Is that clear? Yeah. Hooray. I haven't tried explaining this before, but that's, that's it. So we're going to see that again. It's very short. Right, so that, that introduces a new thought, really, I suppose. I mean, that, again, obviously, the sound is coming from the picture, but it's not coming in sync quite, because um, when the film travels through the projector, it reaches the, the gate, the, the, the bit that lets the light through and the, onto the screen first, and then a second later, 
it reaches the sound re reproducing head. And um, the mechanism is intermittent where the film's going through the gate because that's how film works, through 24 static images. So the moving film's got to be s frozen for a split second before it moves on, a bit like the way a sewing machine works. And, um, but by the time it reaches the sound head, it's got to be a fluid motion, otherwise you're going to get some nasty sort of fluttery, wowy sounds, a bit like that. Um, so that's why there's a separation of a second, and I haven't attempted to realign them in this particular version. So, um, so you're, you're seeing the image, and then a second later you're hearing that particular sound that relates to that image. And it's the lines that are moving just out of frame to your right. So if we had a, a wider, slightly wider gate, we would see the, the optical tr track on the right of the picture. Um, the EQ on that, is, um, it, it, it sounds a bit, <laughs> I don't know, like bodily functions, a lot of that film, but uh, it probably needs a bit more subtle EQing. Um, okay, so we're going to go to the next film, which is quite recent. Um, it's really a bit of a work in progress, I suppose. And um, this was made using, as I mentioned before, a bunch of old thrown out bits of film and old film stocks, which I probably wouldn't have put through a camera because they're too, a bit too risky, a bit too out of date. Instead, I put them into a bucket of water this summer. Actually, I was doing a lot of stuff this summer on this and um, just leaving out in the, in the quite warm weather for a few days and then harvesting it, collecting it and seeing what it looked like and seeing what kind of action was created on the film itself by natural processes. So it's really about the, you know, the decay of the image. It's actually called decomposition. Um, so I think it speaks for itself. You're seeing the actual erosion of the film material. Uh, John mentioned earlier I should talk about grain. Grain is a, is a phenom phenomenon of film that you may not realize, but um, um, I mean, I c you could say it's equivalent to the digit, but it's not really. But uh, the film consists of, you know, very fine grains of this silver halide or color materials, which um, are different on every frame. That's why film is very, very different from digital images. If if a, if a digital image is, a, you know, if it's a tripod shot of an image, it maintains exactly the same digital composition from one. Um, frame to the next, if you like. But on film, every grain, you know, every, every frame is different because the, the, grain, the granular configuration is different. And you can see the grain. You'll see, certainly see grain. You'll see the breakup of the image in this one. It makes it quite apparent. But on a lot of films, and especially my films, actually, you can, most, most commercial films try to disguise grain. They, they want it to be a see-through image that looks like you know, a nice scene that you can believe in. But um, filmmakers from my sort of background, which is really taking fine art into, you know, in, into a, a, film, a film practice where you're exploring the materials and they're part of it, like, you know, a painting doesn't disguise its paint marks. It's that kind of approach. So grain become, can become quite important in that respect.
Okay. Yeah, can I lace it with one hand? That's really interesting. Uh, wait it's going through, that's right. Okay, so this is um, a two projector film. Again, its origin was 1970, early 70s, 1972. So, again, one of these films which I made out of this kind of exploration of rhythm and sound, sound in rhythm and picture. Can I just ask a question? Yeah, you can, yeah. Yes, please do, yeah. Uh, was that when you put it out, when, when you put the film out in the garden, was it exposed film or film that you then processed? No, it was, it was just raw film. So it was film, it was exposed to light, obviously, because it was out in the garden, but it was, um, no, it hadn't gone through a camera. Right. Yeah. So it was the raw material that normally would be put through a camera and exposed to light. But instead of doing that, I just put it straight into a bucket of water. And initially, I... Um, Initially, I put some sort of um, organisms in there, like bits of earth, and you know, if you leave water out in a bucket, very soon you get things like growing in it or swimming around in it. So I thought maybe they would help, but it seemed to work when the water was fairly clean, actually, as well. It's just the natural process of decay. <laughs> and if you leave it too long, the whole thing comes off. You just got a white film, just a clear film is left. So the, you know, a lot of stuff got thrown away. Um, right, the next film is, is, is the most optical of the films. You've seen quite a few optical films. After that, it settles down a bit, I think. After that, it's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit quieter. Um, and I should say that I don't... This is just one aspect of my practice. At the same time I was making these films, I was also doing live performances, which was silent, and uh, making silent black-and-white films as well. So um, this is like one, one path I was exploring at that time. This one is called Cycles 3, and it uses two projectors um, and two optical soundtracks. So it's a little bit similar technique to the first one you saw, which is called Sound Shapes. I think that's about it.
Yeah, thanks. It took a little while to get that one working, but we got it in the end, I think. Um, it's, it comes from having two, two ways of controlling the sound. One was from the projectors themselves, and the other is from the mixer. And I was messing around on the projectors, and I should really have kept my hands off that. Because when you, when you um, touch those pots, they can, you know, they can sort of give you these sudden jolts. My fault. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, yeah, go on. Hmm. What, what, what brings you back to working with analog versus digital? Um, I, knew, I never really stepped away from analog. What do you see as the main difference between analog and digital? What is it that makes you want to work in analog versus digital? I mean, I think I enjoy it a lot more. There's a little bit of physical action which I, mm. I miss if I, if I sit at a computer too long and do stuff. So just from a completely selfish point of view, yeah, I actually enjoy the process. And also, analog is, um, you know, the processes that one's use, using, and it is very much about the processes. You know, the, the material suggests ideas to you, and there are very different kinds of ideas or material effects or things to discover, obviously, with an analog medium than digitally. Um, I mean, it's very much about process, about chance and... You know, if you if you scratch a film, you're going to see the scratch on the screen. But if you scratch a, you know, digital, don't know what you would you would don't know what you would actually scratch. Maybe a surface. I'm not sure. You just ruin it, wouldn't it? So, there's no real correlation between the physical ways of handling, you know, a, a digital image and the image itself. In in that sense, there probably are other ways. Um, so, you know, I did think that. At one time, I thought maybe film is just, it was all, you know, it's all about process, and digital isn't about process. But I think just digital has very different kinds of processes, that's all. And I'm only coming to terms with what those are. I do enjoy working with computers and digitally, but it's just a very different kind of activity. And I'm, for some reason, I'm never quite sure when something's finished when I'm working digitally. It seems to have so many ways it can go. Um, but that's just a question of getting used to it, I think. I came to it late. Um, yeah, I mean, some people of my generation, like John Smith, do you know his work at all? You know, this, or William, who works here, William Rabin. Well, William moved into um, 35 mil, thinking that was the way to go. And then pretty soon after that, he realized, you know, why not just work digitally? It's so much easier. Um, but I've never really been that interested in the image, just as an image. You know, it's it's um, it's always the image in relation to how it's made. So I've done work for galleries, and it's where the projector's in the gallery, and you see the film strip going through, and you see the image, and you can see that connection, that relationship between uh, image and Im well, material and image. Any any other comments? Yeah. Oh, wait, somebody. Yeah. This one I just showed is called Cycles 3. Uh, the reason it's called Cycles 3 is that the, well, the first part that you saw, which is just using one projector, was made in around, well, mid 70s. I did some of it in 1972, and I did some more in 77, because it's got two stages. One was I was like sticking little dots onto the film and punching holes in the film. And then the second stage, five years later, when I was working at the Filmmaker's Co-op, I, I actually put it through a, pr a printer which allows you to make light changes. And so the fluctuations in the background were, were all done through copying the film, at the stage of copying the film. And then, much later in 2003, when I had a, two projectors, I was playing around and getting more interested in live performance and the sort of experiential aspects of projection. Uh, that's when I kind of came up with this version using two projectors. One projector has a, a slight amber filter on it and is projected slightly bigger. Sometimes they kind of leapfrog, so the, uh, the center one will grow until it's bigger than the, the one that was bigger and vice versa. Then that keeps going bigger and bigger. Or sometimes I've used other colors. But so 
I guess that's another indication about my practice is that I, I never consider a piece as being finalized, you know, in a way it, it just has more potential for other possibilities. So I could put a blue filter and you could be watching that for the first half and then a red filter on the other one and you'd have a completely different kind of experience. Um, so that's, that's all that's to do with abstraction. What you can do just with the raw material. Uh, the next section, is, I've got three films here, I think, um, and they, that uses um, camera at some stage. And also, as I mentioned, uh, the printing, how you actually can copy the film and copy it again and again and make... Uh, in a digital world, if you copy a digital image, it sh there's no reason why it should degenerate at all, unless there's something wrong with the material, with the equipment. Um, but a bit like, you know, if you've ever done photocopying and photocopied that photocopy co and then done that, you get this sort of generational thing happening. And that's something that's quite interesting in film. So it'll do the same, it'll, it'll degrade, it'll become more contrasty or something will happen to it every time you make a new generation. So I'll show the first film and then of these three and then perhaps talk after that one. There'll be a short pause.
Yeah, even that film's pretty old as well. It's 44 years old, um, 1974. And um, it's, it's a film that went through a camera, but I didn't put it through the camera. It's a film that I found. So it's, it comes under this general heading of found footage, which is a bit of an old-fashioned term, I suppose. Um, uh, but it's actually a, a large body of works which use found footage. Are you going to say something? I have two questions. Um, I think your work uh, uses duration quite a lot, right? Could you, uh, could you talk about why you use duration and repetition? Okay. That's a good question because it gets us away from the uh, purely technical side of things. Um, I, I guess it comes from a kind of the less is more philosophy, you know, that you don't need very much to to focus in on something. I mean, if you, I guess as students, you probably know that if you're set limitations, it's a lot easier to deal with trying to invent your way out of limitations than if you're given a complete freedom to do something, you know. So with each of these ideas, I've, I've limited myself down to something very specific and then try to explore it and see where it takes me and, and just be responsive to the actual processes. But that does take me into the idea of duration because um, you need to go past a certain point of expectation to reach another sort of level of understanding. It's beginning to sound slightly Buddhist or something <laughs> like that. But <laughs> it is a bit like that. And, you know, um, you know, we're very used to quick images, especially nowadays, you know. I mean, these are quick images in, in many ways, but they don't actually change. They just repeat in, with slight variations. It's not so dissimilar to minimal music, is it? Uh, it's just like you know, cyclical things that repeat in different phases, come together in different ways. Like this particular film uses positive and negative of the same image, which when they're put together, they create a, a relief pattern. It's called bass relief. And it looks like the light is shining from one side, which makes it look like it's carved out of stone or something. Um, I mean, that's there are equivalent procedures. Even J.S. Bach used sort of inversions and 
cannons and all these sort of structural devices to make the most out of a very small phrase. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's fully answering your question, but yeah, I, I do believe in, not believe in, but I, I like the, the approach of presenting you something which you've got to deal with yourself through, through the sort of experience of time. Um, it's not going to give you. It's not going to give you more than you put into it in a way. Did you want to come back on that? Um, so obviously, it's non-narrative, and so you've chosen not to write a story, but you've chosen to do something, present something that's durational for the audience. And and durational, um, as I, I do remember Al Reese talking about duration as a, a method of presenting representation as an act of becoming rather than the presentation of what has already become, right? Um, so is that part of the intent? That was a reference to Al Rees, the late, great Al Rees. Um, yeah, uh, that's a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'm trying to remember it. The Yeah, so Denise is saying we're living in the here and now as we perceive it. It's not a foretelling story. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, that's probably a very good way of putting it. Uh, it sounds, whether I would, um, yeah, you know, there's lots of theories around. I mean, when I was making these films, there's a theory of structural materialism, which I have never really completely subscribed to. But, um, it's just too complicated an expression. But, but this idea, yeah, it, it, it sounds good. I'll have to think about it, see whether it really applies to my practice, but it sounds like it's coming from the right quarter. And I really respect Al Reese's writings. And he has written about my work too, so, um, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's true. You look at a photograph, it's a thing of the past, and you're just... Photographs are intrinsically sad, aren't they? Because they are of something that's past. Um, whereas the film... Yeah, we're talking about certain fil kinds of films, aren't we? Would you call, say that's true of Hollywood? Yeah. Mm. Right. This is good. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you get that? Denise is saying that analog more than digital is uh, more about bin being in the here and now. Uh, yeah, it's true. It's true. I. I certainly like the fact that, like in this situation, um, we have you, me, the projectors. Uh, we know everything that's happening. Uh, you don't need to be, you don't need to uh, like a PhD to understand how a 60 mil projector works. It, it's just basic optics and mechanics, a bit of electricity, and you're done, you know. Um, chemistry as well, of course. Um, so that, that sense of everything being revealed as part of the experience, that's, that's important to me. And so I do like to show my work live. That's why I do a lot of these live performances where there might be, working with my partner, Lin Lu, we, um, she also makes work along these lines, but we work together and do live presentations with up to six projectors. That's the most as we've ever done, but usually it's about two or three. Um, yeah, I like that. I like that. That thought. It's also anti-illusionary, isn't it? It's about anti-illusion. It's about not presenting you with a narrative. Or a yes, yes, but that's the that that's right. Yeah, it's not illusional. Illusion. Well, it's a different kind of illusion. That's the thing. Um, there are all kinds of illusions taking place in front of you. You know, you get two. You get a triangle and a rectangle on adjacent frames, and it becomes a strange combined shape. There's a kind of illusion of two separate time events. 
because one thing you discover when you're making this kind of frame by framework is that the eye is actually quite a slow responder to inputs it it and that gives you the um well if you know the sparkler effect which we'll all be doing in a few days time actually isn't it like that sort of thing if you do that you get a line because you don't you i mean in theory you should see just a point of light moving like that but you get a line moving like that because um that information takes time to process and and retain it stay, stays on our retina longer than it's presented to the retina and hence the we don't see the step separate stages of movement um yeah there's a lot of perceptual psychology involved in film which you don't i mean again that's the other reason for using it you don't really you're not really you're not really asked to think when you're working digitally um you you're obviously asked to think about the thing you've made but you're not it doesn't really put you in the question of um think hey what is happening here in terms of the way i s i perceive my my perceiving mechanism and the and the what and what that's doing over there that projector that's projecting all these individual frames any more comments or thoughts or questions yeah Was that different for you, for example? Um, yeah, uh, uh, um, different um, in the seventies, for example, when you composed this, made it, than now, for example. The question was: Is was the here and now something we were thinking about in the seventies, sixties? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's all about the here and now. Um, uh, I mean, not not put like that. No, not that's. I guess uh, maybe George Harrison, when he went to India, he might have been talking about the here and now, and uh, you know. But um, no, the, the debates that were going on in the seventies were about illusionism versus versus well okay let's let's define this whether illusion i mean in relation to mainstream cinema as i said earlier we're invited to suspend disbelief i think it is to enter that world not be interrupted by anything by the join by the cut that you're cutting from one shot to another by the actors don't look at the camera because that breaks the illusion i mean there's all kinds of devices that are common practice in cinema which maintain this sort of world through through this window that we, we we believe in and then through that we get some sort of catharsis uh, so the that was anathema to people like peter cadell malcolm de grice who are the the main sort of gurus of that period and um, i mean peter cadell came up with the term structural materialism uh, in which you know it was rigorously anti-illusionist But anti-illusionist in that sense, if I'd had a bit more kind of sense at that time, I'd have said, well, hang on, aren't we watching something which is completely illusory? Uh, as I said earlier, you know, it's that kind of amazing um, dichotomy, if you like, between what that's what's happening over there with that little bit of film strip with holes in it and, and little tiny images and what's happening on the screen. There's all kinds of visual and oral illusions taking place. Um, But no, this was all about. It's very much anti Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood was seen as, as um, a bit like you know, was it Marx? Religion is the opium of the people. It's that kind of sense. It was it was taking us away from our real understanding of the world. It was just an escape, and therefore it was the enemy. It was quite severe. Do you remember that time? Yeah, and I was in a sense I was influenced by that in that I my practice had to become very rigorous and uh, although i was never one of the chosen people who who would um you know an example of of a sort of structural materialism i think some of my work probably fitted into it but others didn't uh but i i did feel it was actually a very good schooling for me because it was um i had to be very clear about what i was intending to do and and, and not let not let stray things get into the work but actually really concentrate on the on the piece that you're working on and see how far you can push it um 
Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, so we don't have to see all the films. Um, I could move on to the next one. Now, that the next one does use a camera. I'll, ex I'll describe it to you because it probably helps you understand it. Um, first of all, the very last section of this film you just saw called At the Academy. Uh, at the Academy means Academy Leader. And somebody much, much later pointed out to me that I'm not actually using Academy Leader, which is a certain kind of leader. This is just a kind of BBC countdown leader. So I got the title wrong. But anyway, the very last section, um, I was using something which you could do on a timeline of Adobe Premiere, which is to take one strip of information with, say, you know, like a, an image every few frames, and then just move it on one frame, put it on the next line down, and the next line down, and the next line down. So it would be up, wouldn't it, because it's on the visual part. And, and that would, and then blend them together, and they create a sort of seamless movement through, really, from one of these single moments in time to the next. So it's a way of kind of blending images by staggering them when they're printed. This was done, so I think that last film was printed maybe, and the next one you're going to see, printed maybe nine times by s displacing it just one frame on the timeline. It wasn't a timeline, it was a printer through which we put the, the raw material. Um, incidentally, just to go back to uh, at the Academy, um, at the time I wasn't particularly interested in the sound, but now I am much more interested in what was happening to the sound, uh, in that the, the beep, which appears usually on a three, but in this case, on this BBC countdown leader, it was on the, a double beat, I think, on the four. It's like boop, boop, like that. How that plays out. And then you've got the, the join, which is like a thump, like a, like a sort of, that's where you, the loop is joined together with sellotape. You get this thump sound. So you've got those two distinct sounds which are going through the identical duplicating process using light passing through the material as the picture. So that was kind of interesting. Right, so the next one is called Night Train. It's very short. It was shot on a train from London to Birmingham because I, until recently, I was teaching at University of Wolverhampton. Um, I currently teach at Middlesex University, by the way, in the uh, animation department. Um, and with this film, I lowered the train window in the days when you could do that. I um, clamped bracket onto the window with a camera on it and the camera's pointing across the landscape and it's at night and as the and then the shutter is rolling very slowly so basically it, it reduces the time from London to Birmingham actually it's Birmingham to London uh, to, to about two minutes so it's like an hour and a half journey is reduced to two minutes using this time lapse this slowly moving camera recording the lights in the landscape and um, and then I use this technique of staggering it to create to make it flow. So all these individual frames of light were blended into a, more of a continuous strip. And that also became the sound. So it's complicated technically, but to visually it's actually quite straightforward.
film. That'll be the last one I think probably. Unless you just saw that talk. Um, huh? At least 20 minutes. But yeah. But do we have to be out? By I, I don't think there's another class here after us. Yeah. So I, I think we've got quite a few I wanted to show you some gentler films because it's not all hardcore. <laughs> I could sell you a DVD. I bought a couple of DVDs. <laughs> On this DVD, which I produced with Lux, it's called Optical Sound Films, and um, there's about three or four, which the last one you saw, the train, um, and then there's this one called Railings, there's one called Soundtrack, which is just of railway lines, and there's one of a staircase called Musical Stairs. All those four use um, a camera image, a film that's been put through a camera, and then those images are converted into sound uh, using a rather laborious technique of making a spare print, slicing it down vertically down the length of the film and rolling it over so that the picture area falls into the soundtrack area and then sellotaping it back again so it all holds together. So it was a very physical way of creating a soundtrack from the original picture and then it's all synced up in the final printing so that it's a case of what you see is what you hear. What you hear is what you see. Um, yeah. Uh, is that something you discovered yourself? Uh, it is something I discovered myself. And I, in a way, I was surprised that other people weren't doing this. And I don't really, haven't really found anyone else doing it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, and William, who works here, do you know William Rabin, any of you? No, he works, I guess, in the sort of film, yeah. film department, yeah. He's sort of my generation. In fact, we worked together at the Filmmakers Co-op when it first kind of got some serious money from the BFI. Um, he's made some very powerful optical sound films. Um, uh, but not William Rabin, R-A-B-A-N. And um, sometimes he shows them. But I don't think he used the camera, which then becomes the, the sound. But this is, so this is my, my own little technique. And then this particular film uh, uses um, stages of printing. So I, I generated various copies, and then it involves an editing pattern, which you'll see, which is very straightforward. So it's just a question of how to structure that material that I generated. I've checked the timetable. There isn't another class, so we can go right to the floor. OK. Which means we've got another half hour. OK. All right. So this is, this is railings. And um, the reason. It's a vertical screen. It's because I, this kind of um, 
if you're doing this kind of work, you discover fairly quickly that it's, it's the horizontal lines, like the lines of light in the landscape, which create this, the interesting sounds, because as they're passing through the sound rep reproducing head, it's the, it's the width of those sounds, the thickness of those sounds, that creates a difference of frequencies and volumes. And um, as I was concentrating on railings uh, from a park, just a park near where I lived, uh, I had to put the camera on its side for it to create interesting sounds. I was interested in kind of perspective, what that would sound like. And, um, and uh, hence, I had to put the projector on its side too. Luckily, the projectors don't mind being on their side. But uh, you could use mirrors, but uh, it's a lot easier just to tip the projector over.
So out of this series of four pic uh, films, all made in the late 70s, the first one, I think, was shot from a train. Not the one you saw, but um, it's just the railway tracks. I, was, I wanted to hear what this... You know when you look down the railway tracks and they look a bit like they're snaking around and you suddenly get a sort of division in the tracks and they, they move apart or they go further away to go through a tunnel. I just wanted to hear what that sounded like. And so I made a film with just one continuous take looking at that. And then the second one I made called Musical Stairs. <clears throat> um, it took a staircase, like an iron staircase, uh, sort of like an escape staircase, fire escape, and the camera was positioned at the front, at the bottom, and it would look at different combinations of stairs. So if it was looking down, you're just seeing two or three steps, and then as it went higher, getting more and more. So that division of the frame into more and more, or less and less, would create different uh, frequencies. So that was a way I explored that one. That wasn't a continuous take. I then started editing it to create a sort of pattern, a bit like walking up and down steps. And then with this one, this is in a way the more, more complicated because it's um, it's gone through a printing stage. I, I wanted to try and like freeze the image to see if what if that would change the sound. And um, basically, I developed an editing pattern which was you know three three rolls of film all on a dispenser. A splicer, and I just took so much off each one and added some black leader and kept going until it all ran out. Um, so it was a very kind of um, simplistic way of editing, but it creates a very, very bold structure, which in a way it needs to otherwise get lost in all that stuff. It, it gives you a sort of uh, handle, a way of sort of dealing with what you're looking at. So they all had quite different structures, but the idea was to bring out different qualities in the sound through these different structures. Yeah. Have you ever worked with magnetic sounds? Uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, in the, I was going to say old days, <laughs> but um, in that, uh, that period of time, and this was before, or well, just at the time actually, uh, when video, chunky, video recorders were coming in, which you know involved a, a big camera with a lead that went to a, a box that you had on your shoulder, and it would only do black and white, and it was very difficult to edit. So I wasn't really attracted to that at all, but when I was at Chelsea Art School, there were, my contemporaries were playing around with video. It leads to a very different kind of practice. Well, that's using a kind of magnetic uh, tape, I suppose. Is it? It's magnetic, isn't it? Um, but with film, the way you worked with sound then, uh, if you weren't using optical soundtracks, I mean, okay, optical soundtracks, which I could show, you, and perhaps that's the way we could end the session, is I can show you the materials, I can show you the projector, and you can receive for yourselves what the mechanics and all the physical aspects of this are for yourselves. Anyway, um, so, yeah, optical soundtrack isn't this rare, weird thing. It's actually was the main way in which films were presented in cinemas until relatively recently, actually, when they went digital. Uh, so for, well, sound came in in the 20s, 1920s, late 20s, I think. And um, so from about 1930 up to maybe 1990 or something like that, all the films that you'd see in cinemas had this little band of, of sound, sound, which was optical sound, because you could reproduce the picture and the sound at the same time, so it made a very cheap and convenient way of doing it if you want to make several prints and have them circulate. With magnetic, you have to re-record it each time, which is hugely laborious. Even though even th then it, made, it was a better quality sound, you had a higher frequency range than with optical sound, which is actually quite limited in its range at the, at the higher frequencies. Um, and uh, yeah, so the way we, if you wanted to work with magnetic, you'd have a table called a steamboat, which I still have, I still use, uh, it has one track for your picture, and it has one or two, or possibly three tracks for your sound, and the sound would be carried on a magnetic piece of film, exactly the same dimensions as this, but it's completely covered with iron oxide. And um, therefore you could cut length for length. If you wanted to cut in a few frames of a soundtrack, you could just cut the, using a, actually an angle joiner, 
because you don't hear the, the popping sound so much. Um, you cut that and then you can rearrange, you can actually do physical cutting of sound, which is kind of interesting. Is that one of the things you do here with, with audio, magnetic tape, like, like reel-to-reel, uh, quarter-inch tape? A few students have that. Yeah, yeah. Not that many working with it. Yeah. So... Um,